we have, uh, as we wrap up today, I've got a couple of things that I want to uh, uh, put in a plug for. You heard the plugs earlier for TEDx Youth. That's November uh, 18th at the Catherine Kilburn Brigham Center for Creativity at the Plains Art. We have the uh, December 1st which I believe is a Saturday. That's the TEDx Women's event uh, that'll be at a Catalyst. Uh, so those are two things to put on your calendar for forward-looking people that plan. Uh, the other uh, element that I would uh, also want to uh, uh, plug is we had a video that we thought about showing today. Didn't get a chance to squeeze it in. It was a little bit longer than some of the other ones. It's about an 18-minute long TED talk. It's called How to Build a Better Block. Uh, and we would highly recommend that for people that are interested in building uh, uh, in engaging uh, cities. Uh, it's a very, very fun video. It's about a group of people that uh, decide uh, to take uh, one block at a time uh, without getting permission from city officials, uh, without going through all the regulations. They just sort of storm in and revitalize a block overnight uh, with some very fun uh, kind of guerrilla activities. Uh, certainly would meet the playful uh, element. But anyway, so how to build a better block is our uh, a recommended video that we'd send you out with today. Uh, other things that I want to make sure as you, uh, before you leave today, we have had the Twitter feed going uh, in the other room on that screen going. If you uh, want to check and see what people are saying about the event or has, as it's been going on, it's fun to uh, you know, check in on that. Uh, I'm going to offer a few closing remarks. Uh, our curator, uh, Greg Tavine, who's the key guy behind this, has come up and offer some closing uh, thank yous after me. So with, uh, let me just uh, share a few thoughts on, uh, for myself on, on what I think is important about uh, City 2.0. Uh, the first uh, thing which I would want to share uh, is that uh, we are very uh, blessed to be where we are. We, are, we should have a lot of gratitude uh, living in not only the greatest region in the world, we learned about that today, that the Midwest, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the best place to be in the galaxy, uh, sitting in the larger uh, uh, metro region uh, around Fargo, we are, we are in a really, really special spot. Uh, and that is uh, not only for all the abundance that we have uh, agriculturally, but energy, uh, education resources, human resources. We, 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 are, we, we are arguably in one of the best positions as a state and in a region to take advantage of the future that's coming at us. And, and part of that is we have all of these resources, uh, and we also don't have the things that are holding us back. Many uh, larger cities have got uh, serious budget issues. They've got serious, uh, in, sometimes intractable social issues uh, that are holding them back. And there really isn't any limitation that I can see here other than our ability to envision a stronger and better and smarter uh, future for ourselves. And so I think, uh, again, the, the important thing is that we, as a group, and this, if you're saying, let's get a group of thought leaders in a room, We've done that with all of you that are here today and with everybody who's watching online. Uh, if you're spending the time to do that, I started out saying congratulations, because congratulations, you are a thought leader that's helping to shape the future, not just here. I know we've got at least 10 people that have come over from Bismarck. We've got people from Foston. We've got somebody from that's here all the way from, from uh, Australia. Uh, we've got people from, you know, all, we're touching people all over the globe, but when we, when we the events this week in City 2.0 had an intention of building better cities around the whole world, but the way you do that is you start with your own. You clean up your side of the street, so to speak. And so for the, for the majority of the people that are here that have an opportunity to leave here today and think about how do we make our city a better place, uh, we have to start from this point of gratitude, which is we just, we don't have the issues that other people do. We have the resources, and if we don't have the city that we want, there is, there's, no, there's no place to place blame on you know, some politician or some budget issue or something, because we have everything it takes. It's just gonna take leadership, innovation, volunteerism, and the willing to go out and try and do something new and different, uh, like the ideas you just saw on the action pitch. Like, those action pitches were great, like the ideas you saw presented by our presenters today. Grab a hold of the one that you think is your favorite, spend some time on it, push it, develop it, contact them, reach out to them, and see if you can engage with them and push some of these ideas uh, forward, because it's like I said, the, there is no limitation uh, to what, you know, or they say, well, the old thing, the sky's the limit. Well, we have a lot of sky in North Dakota. We have a lot of, <laughs> a lot of that here uh, available. So we're starting from that point of gratitude, but I think one of the other things which we have to understand, and now that we're smarter about how cities are built, one of the things that is holding back mid-sized cities of our size is that we're stuck in a, in a 1950s model of expansion to the edge. And that 
expansion to the edge is something we're comfortable with, we're familiar with it, involves let's build a new school that's you know a couple miles out in a wheat field and everyone will build houses around it and it all kind of just keeps on working and we all think it's okay until you have someone like the summer stocked in California who files for bankruptcy. A community larger than ourselves, but part of what they got into trouble was because you know, they had, their economic engine had been built over the last number of decades by taking fees from the people that were developing on the edge, uh, but then when they took those fees, it didn't cover the fact that you have to take care of the infrastructure, meaning the sewer, the water, the plumbing, the firemen, the policemen, the and men and women, all of that cost of running a city, uh, you know, that you take on that responsibility in perpetuity. And in case somebody hasn't checked, perpetuity means forever. Okay, so a developer offers to build, you know, new sidewalks, new streets, and hey, we'll build all this thing, and we'll have a new development, we'll sell some homes. You know, they put it in. That stuff wears out after 20 years, you know, or 30 years, or 15 years. And so we end up with a situation where we're not fully taking in the accounting of the replacement cost of all of the development on the edge, and that puts pressure, you know, on the economic health of the city. The alternative uh, when, is to think about things where we can increase density. And I think when we grow up in a rural area, in a rural part of the country, that density becomes you know, a word that is almost sort of a bad word. We associate density with bad as opposed to density with good. So we have to sort of re-envision you know, that density is a place where collaboration happens. And place, density is a place where interaction happens, where diversity happens, and where opportunity happens. And density is also more economic. It's much, much more economic. Uh, an example, a simple example, there's a project going on down the street about 100 feet from here. Uh, this was in a building uh, that had a 100-year-old building, and it had an occupancy, employment occupancy of about three, three employees, maybe three to five, some part-time in that building, uh, and partly because only the first floor was code. Basement, you know, there was not two fire rated stairways to get to the upper floors, and so those buildings were not occupiable by code, nor was the basement. So now you come along and you have a, an opportunity to take a 100-year-old structure and you renovate it and you have, bring it up to code and second floor is available, third floor is available, build a new fourth floor on top of it, basement's available. So you take 9,000 square feet occupiable space with you know, three to five you know, part-time service jobs. You replace that with 120 uh, jobs that expand a mixed use of, of you know, retail, hospitality, uh, software engineering, new startups uh, in a space, and all of a sudden you got 120 people in a building where you used to have two or three, and guess what the city had to do to make that happen? They didn't have to build another foot of sidewalk, they didn't have to build another foot of curb, they didn't have to build any more you know, plum sewer or plumbing, didn't have to add any fire, didn't have to add any police, didn't have to do any of that. And so, and I think we, you know, we, we understand. I don't know if any of you have ever gone out and hired 27 people. If you're trying to build a company, it's a scary thing. Uh, when the city here took on the, the, uh, the city of Fargo, uh, took on the responsibility for the area around uh, Davies High School, that meant 27 more full-time employees uh, for both fire and, and, and police. And that's forever. Okay, that's, you know, and that's new fire halls, that's expansion. And we have in our mind that that kind, of, that kind of growth is just, that's good, that's good, let's go to the ribbon cutting, let's do that. But we have to challenge ourselves when, when within five minutes of where we're standing right now, there's 72 acres of unbuilt space. You saw how big that project was earlier, the 18 acres up at West Acres. There's four times that much space within a five minute walk of where we are that is currently used for surface parking. Used to have density when Fargo was a more dense city. Used to be there was buildings on all of those things. Used to be there was historic, I mean, there, there was, the activity was down here. So part of what we have to do is be, uh, if we wanna be a city 2.0, and, and it's important, if we wanna have the people that are, <clears throat> just like when, when uh, we were talking about making smart financial choices and not spending more than what you have as a family, it's important that we create governmental organizations that can live within their means and can be smart about how they do that. And part of that is making smart economic choices and understanding that the competition isn't about how wide we can be in the future. It's about, you know, in some ways it's about density because when you have density, then you can have things like rideshare. When you have density, you can have things like walkable neighborhoods. When you have density, you get all of these additional benefits. And so I think that it's, you know, that's one of the elements that I want to just pitch into the whole soup that we had today of all these great ideas, that all of those ideas are more affordable, all of them are more accessible, all of them are more usable, all of them can happen if we end up with a situation where we do infill as opposed to sprawl. 
And we, the city today, uh, just focusing again on Fargo, has uh, more square miles or about the same square miles as Boston. Uh, I don't think anybody thinks that Boston is, you know, a really awful city. Boston's a wonderful, fabulous, great, energetic city full of history and, and culinary and arts and education and a lot of things that cities around the world would aspire to. Uh, but so we, we have a lot of potential. We can grow into that over time. It's not that we it's not that we want to shrink. It's that we want to be smart. We want to be smart about how we grow and we want to do the things that are most economic first because when we do that, that means that we'll have the resources to do all these cool things that we want to do. So it's a, uh, everything gets easier with density. The powerful economics of density, that's my little quick, I, my, my little, maybe it wasn't that quick, but that's my, <laughs> my, uh, that's my pitch. So anyway, I'm, uh, uh, I'm excited for the opportunity to, uh, to be here and participate and to work with a, a lot of folks that are here. Uh, I think we have a, a, a you know, tremendous opportunity going forward. Let's, you know, talk about, a, a thought about our future. Uh, North Dakota, I uh, introduced the concept of North, think about how many of you have heard that China is really booming economically? Uh, you probably have all heard that. You know, China's going like crazy. China's growing at China speed. Turns out North Dakota is actually growing at China speed. Uh, North Dakota has had, uh, you know, about a 7% uh, increase in GDP over the past decade. Uh, so our growth is uh, among, as an individual state, is among some of the top in the world in terms of the kind of growth that you would like to aspire to. Uh, we've got the lowest unemployment. Uh, we've got this large surplus at the state level. Uh, that, you know, so there's a lot of things that are very positive. The Fargo, the Fargo, Moorhead, West Fargo, Metropolitan Statistical Area, uh, MSA, if, those, if anybody's familiar here from business or marketing, where they take all the cities and they line them up. We've been moving up the list. We're now 202 in terms of uh, like 354 tracked MSAs. Uh, but there are cities that are ahead of us, uh, like uh, a Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, you know, that's got 300,000 people. We've got a guest here today that great, shared some great ideas from Grand Rapids. They're at about, uh, you know, 780,000 people. But the MSA area for Fargo is now listed at 212,000 people. So we, had, we have to start thinking of ourselves when we think about the city. Uh, and even though I've used city of Fargo examples, I want to make sure that whenever, when, we're, when, when we talk about, you know, when someone talks about Chicago, they don't mean necessarily just Chicago. And if someone says, I'm from the Chicago area, they might mean Hinsdale, and they might mean uh, you know, some beautiful city on the North Shore like Kenilworth. They might seem made something on the South Side. But they t you know, the, the metro area is called Chicago. So when we think of our, our metro area that's centered around uh, the city of Fargo right here, you know, the only way that you can have a great metro area is if you have a great vibrant core. You have to have a vibrant core. One of the things that I've noticed is that we've got Concordia and Moorhead State in their advertising and marketing to make this a great college town. They're using images of downtown Fargo as part of their how do you recruit people to come to school in Moorhead. Uh, it is, you know, we have to let, we have to diminish the, our idea of what the borders are. We have to let go of some of the labeling. We have to get comfortable with the idea that in this, I keep calling it the metro area, and I do that because I'm nervous if I say, you know, the Fargo area, then people that are in West Fargo or East Fargo or Moorhead or South Fargo or North Fargo will feel like somehow they're excluded. But we've got a brand uh, that is around the name Fargo that is actually, you know, more well known than the state. Uh, it's sort of, you know, tongue in cheek in the book uh, that you're all receiving, but I think that's true that we've got this great brand to build around and the things are happening. So if we talk about the Fargo metro area, I hope no one's offended and everybody feels included uh, because we have this, this idea of this, you know, vibrant, a vibrant core. Fargo that everybody benefits from, whether you're which side of the border you're on or which jurisdiction you're in or which school district you're in, everybody benefits from having this, you know, the vibrant, active uh, core as the center of that, just like you would when you've got a great downtown in Chicago or a great downtown in London or a great downtown in, in San Francisco. Everybody in the entire region benefits from that. So, and I think the other piece, which I want to also say when you talk about the powerful economics of density, and that allows you to create these cool, vibrant downtown communities, all of the companies that want to move here in the future, whether it's in medical services, it's, it's Accenture or Sanford recruiting a doctor, whether it's Microsoft trying to recruit a top software developer, whether it's a set of entrepreneurs that are starting out, they need people and, and you know, our unemployment's low, that's a good thing, but we need to recruit people to come here. And the number one amenity that gets people to want to move to a city is the fact that, hey, this is a cool place and I saw this cool downtown and there's a cool restaurants and there's nightlife and there's whatever and my spouse will you know, have job opportunities to move here. So guess what? Downtown Fargo, 
the center of the vibrant Fargo metro region is being used as a recruiting tool for everybody in the area to get more people to come here, to start companies, fill jobs, and do that. This is not about Fargo. It's about the broader community. You don't get to 212,000 people in that count for our, for our community without counting just about everybody in Clay County, just about everybody in Cass County. So my point is when, when people see the work going on in downtown Fargo, I hope people can understand that that it benefits the entire region and it is the number one recruiting tool that people are using to get people to come here. Professors, doctors, you know, developers, people starting things. So, you know, you got to start with the core. You got to have a vibrant core. You got to understand the powerful economics of density. If you do that, it becomes a positive spiral where great things happen in the core. That recruits more people to want to live in the city. That improves the economics of the whole thing and everything goes from there. So in the end, it is all about economics. Economics begins with understanding the power of density and it's about building uh, you know, great communities that can then economically afford to do all the cool ideas we saw today. So that's what we're all about and we're trying to make that happen. And so we feel we're working on a root cause problem by focusing on the core. And with that, we can become a metro area that will be, uh, can envision a future that's greater than any of us can perhaps imagine. It might be up to our kids to envision how great that could be because they've got the imaginations that we limit ourselves too much as adults, but envision that great future and we can become a, a role model for, for cities not just in the Midwest but for around the globe of how we can have great quality of life, uh, great ability to give back, great caring, and great community. So with that, I want to say thank you. Thanks for your attention. Uh, up next is uh, Greg for a few closing comments. You've been a great audience. Let's give one round of applause for all of the fabulous speakers we had today. They did a great job. And, and, a, and, and as I leave, a round of applause for the guy that curated this whole thing, the guy that's been the drive behind bringing TEDx Fargo. Greg, for being, thank you, Greg.